Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Demers. I'm back again and we're going to continue our reading of The Chocolate Touch. Today we're going to read three chapters, chapters 7, 8, and 9. So let's get started. So chapter 7 starts, All right, boys and girls, Miss Plimsoll said, it's almost time for lunch. Clear up your things. Paint pots securely closed, brushes washed, paintings unpinned and laid out to dry. Drawing boards stacked against the wall. Ah, there's the bell. Front row first, Timothy leading. Then Robin, in single file, go. John, alone, walked slowly in the throng, hurrying along the corridors to the school cafeteria. The school was proud of the cafeteria and the food served in it. The room was spacious and bright, with windows all the way along one side overlooking the playground and the playing fields beyond. The opposite side was wholly taken up by the shiny silver service counter. Several boys and girls were already settled at tables by the time John took his place in the line. Enviously, John noticed a boy at the nearby table suck at straws dipped in a milk bottle that was dull with frost. John could imagine the refreshing taste of cold, creamy milk. Let's stop for a second and look at the word enviously. If I'm not sure what that word means, I can look at the context clues around that word to see if I can figure out what it means. So it says enviously, John noticed a boy at a nearby table suck at straws dipped in a milk bottle that was dull with frost. John could imagine the refreshing taste of cold creamy milk. Well. Why couldn't John drink the cold, creamy milk himself? Right, that was because if he did, it would turn to chocolate and he's been having trouble drinking water and orange juice, basically putting anything into his mouth without it turning into chocolate. So he was envious of the boy that could drink the milk. So what do you think that means? Right, he was jealous of the boy and he also wished that he could drink the milk um, and he couldn't. Good job. At another table, a group of girls were eating fat red cherries. John could almost feel the firm fruit on his tongue and the pleasure of biting through the tart, juicy pulp. The cherries must taste good. They must be thirst quenching. John unhappily took a tray from the pile and slid it along the rails in front of the top of the counter. He put a paper napkin, a glass, and a gleaming spoon, a knife, and a fork on the tray. It seemed hardly worth the wait, but he felt that he might as well try the food and drink. Perhaps if I eat a different way, without letting anything touch my lips, he muttered, my lunch won't all change to chocolate. He was not very hopeful. What? asked the boy standing next to him. Nothing, John said. I thought I heard you say something about chocolate, the boy said. I hope this is the day for chocolate cream pie, he added. That would be super. On chocolate cream pie days of the past, John had been known to skip the main course so that he might spend all his lunch money on desserts. The thought of four pieces of chocolate cream pie now suddenly made his stomach feel as though he were on a roller coaster. An uneasy, flibberty, gibberty sensation. John shuddered. Ooh, he, he commented, wrinkling, wrinkling up his nose. The other boy shrugged his shoulders and started to choose his meal. John took a plate of cold chicken and ham, potato chips, and a crisp, moist, lettuce and tomato sandwich. The white of the chicken, the pink of the ham, the gold of the potatoes, the pale green of the lettuce, and the red of the tomato looked delicious. He also took half a pint of milk, a thick crusted whole wheat roll, and a cool pat of butter. A tumbler of water with ice cubes clinking against the glass and a dish of fresh fruit slices of orange and grapefruit and banana and grapes. John's tray was loaded with just the sort of meal his mother was 
always trying to persuade him to eat. Until today, John had always thought it was pretty dull to eat sensible things when there were sweeter food and drink to be had. Today, however, the sensible things looked most appetizing, and his mouth began to water in its new sticky way. Hmm, I think John may be starting to learn something here. We'll get to that later. John paid for the lunch with the money his mother had given him, went to an empty table, and sat down. His fingers trembling slightly with eagerness, he cut a slice of lettuce. His fork went through the leaves with a promising crunch. He stuck the prongs of the fork into a mouth-sized piece of lettuce and carefully inserted it into his mouth. The lettuce didn't touch his wide-stretched lips. John's teeth came together in crisp layers of sweet chocolate. He took a small piece of potato chip, tilted back his head until he was looking straight up at the ceiling, and drop the morsel straight down into his throat. So he's picking apart all of the pieces of his lunch and trying to get them all in his mouth without them touching his lips. He felt it go down, a sharp fragment of sweet chocolate. He tried the milk, the ice water, the fruit. Every solid and liquid that he sampled was transformed as soon as it entered his mouth. Then he became aware of a shocking novelty that he hadn't noticed at breakfast. At the rim of each glass, there was a small semicircle of opaque brown. The bowl of his spoon and the prongs of his fork had become brown. As John watched, horrified, sorry, the areas of magic chocolate slowly spread until at last the glasses and cutlery were all solid chocolate. The trouble was unquestionably growing worse. John's scalp tightened with fear. What am I going to do? He asked himself miserably. Oh dear, oh dear, what is going to happen to me? Leaving his tray of chocolate food and drink and utensils, John stumbled away from the cafeteria and out to the playground. Okay, so that's the end of chapter seven. Um, and before we head into chapter eight, I just want to leave you with a question here. What do you think is going to happen to John? Um, and is there anything that you think he could do about his situation? Um, you know, what should he do next? Is there anything that you can think of that maybe he could try to do so that he can get things back to normal? Okay, you would think that he would love um, having this problem um, because he loves candy and chocolate so much, but I think it's um, it's starting to get on his nerves and he just wants things to get back to normal. Okay, so while you're thinking about that, I'm going to go ahead and start reading chapter eight. English class passed without incident. Miss Plimsoll distributed word lists for her pupils to take home. The more words you know, she explained as always, the more exactly you can think. There were some difficult new words John noticed. Avarice, indigestion, acidity, unhealthiness, moderation, digestibility. As Miss Plimsoll explained the meaning of each one, it seemed to John that though they had all a special bearing on his present uncomfortable condition. At last the bell rang. Very well, class, Miss Plimsoll said. Time for outside activities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Plimsoll. Miss Plimsoll gave the signal for dismissal and the pupils in the front row filed out, followed by those in the second row, including John and Susan. Susan played a violin in the school orchestra and usually she and John went to the rehearsals in the auditorium together. This time, Susan hurried on ahead of him. John followed very slowly. The members of the orchestra were sitting at their music stands on the auditorium stage when John, carrying his dark blue trumpet case, got to his chair in the brass section. Mrs. Quaver had already begun to explain a difficult passage to the girl who played the flute. Just after Jay sings, nestlings chirp and flee, she was saying, 
you come in with your trill. Doodle oodle 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 oo. Do you see the place on your score? Good. Now, normally we think that score means like a score that we get on a test, but here it must mean something different. Um, based on the context here, they're talking about music and she's asking, do you see the place on your score? So we know that it has to do with music and it must be, you know, the piece of music that's in front of them that they are playing. So a lot of times there are words that have multiple meanings in the English language. And how can we figure out what they mean? We can look at the context around what we're reading to try to figure out which word it is in this context, okay? Ah, John, Mrs. Quaver exclaimed, seeing him in his place. I'm glad you're not absent. As I have just told the others, this afternoon we're having the first joint rehearsal of my arrangement of a boy's song by James Hogg. We've been over all the individual parts and all the sections, you will recall. Now it's time to fit the pieces together. John nervously opened his trumpet case and took his shining gold trumpet from its bed of scarlet velvet. The beautiful new instrument gave him confidence. He worked the valves nimbly with his fingers and looked up at Mrs. Quaver again. Now, John, she said, tell me when your little solo begins. Right after the end of the second verse, John promptly replied. He had practiced his part every evening in the basement at home for the last two weeks. He knew every note perfectly. After the line, that's the way for Billy and me. Good, Mrs. Quaver said, and don't forget what I told you, John. This is a happy song. I want you to play ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta-ta, simply repeating the rhythm of the voice. And I want you to be light and lively. This is supposed to be the song of a boy who loves romping in the country. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta, John thought. That shouldn't be too difficult, even with the whole orchestra listening to him. He had played it over and over again at home, but he would have to try extra hard here. This was to be his first solo. Everyone else was depending on him to play it properly. Right, said Mrs. Quaver brightly. With her baton, she rapped twice sharply on the music stand before her. All the musicians brought their instruments into playing position. Susan poised her bow above her strings of her violin. John held his trumpet close to his mouth and wiggled his fingers on the valves. Mrs. Quaver's baton moved from side to side, up and then down. The cymbals clashed and the drums thumped. The pianist brought his fingers down on the ivory keys of the piano. The violinists and cellists made their weeing and whomping sounds. All were in perfect unison. The rehearsal had begun. After the introduction, one of the older boys began to sing. Where the pools are bright and deep, where the gray trout lies asleep, up the river and over the lee, that's the way for Billy and me. After the last line of the first verse, John's fellow trumpeter echoed the rhythm of the singer's voice. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta. Mrs. Quaver smiled approvingly at the successful performance and with her baton gave the singer the signal to begin the second verse. Where the blackbird sings the latest, an oboe went peep. Where the hawthorn blooms the sweetest, where the nestlings chirp and flee. The flute warbled according to plan. That's the way for Billy and me. John swallowed with an effort and put the mouthpiece of his trumpet to his lips for his solo. The mouthpiece instantly changed to chocolate. Then almost as fast, the chocolate spread along the instrument, changing all the flashing gold into dull brown. The first note came out fairly true. Ta, but chocolate trumpets cannot withstand much pressure. The hole in the mouthpiece softened and clogged up and the valve stuck as John desperately tried to finish his part. Mrs. Quaver's eyes almost popped out of her head as she listened to him play. 
Ta ta to ta tur It sounded as though John were trying to play a soap filled bubble pipe. Terribly flustered, he put down his trumpet. Mrs. Quaver was speechless. The orchestra was rocked by uproarious laughter. The other trumpeter leaned over toward John's chair and picked up the trumpet. It's a chocolate trumpet, he shouted derisively. No wonder it sounded like that. John Midas was trying to play a chocolate. John didn't want to hear it anymore. He fled from the stage and out to the playground. Without stopping, even to look around, he ran through the stone gateway and homeward. Okay, so chapter nine. Oh, the shame of it, the humiliation. John wept breathlessly as he ran. Shocked and frightened, indignant and angry at the world that had suddenly turned against him. Mean old things, John thought, blaming Miss Plimsoll and Mrs. Quaver for his failures, even though nothing that had happened to him had been their fault in any way. Horrible old school, he thought, even though he had liked school until that morning. Hateful Susan, he thought, even though he knew at the same time that he was really longing for her to be friendly with him again. Through the window, Mrs. Midas saw John coming up the pathway. Hello, John, dear, she called from the living room. You're home early today. How nice. As a reward, there'll be a piece of chocolate after supper. How do you think he's going to feel about that? I hate it, John shouted. He was crying too hard to say anything else for a moment. When she heard the sound of his voice, Mrs. Midas rushed into the hall. Why, what's the matter, dear? She asked, putting her arm around him. John twisted away from her grasp, ran past her, and started up the stairs toward his bedroom. Susan doesn't want me at her birthday party, he said as he went. I know she doesn't. Well, I don't want to go to her rotten old party anyway. I don't think you really mean that, Mrs. Midas said. Besides, she added, and John was halted by the softness of her voice. Mrs. Buttercup just telephoned to say she was going to drive over herself at four o'clock to pick you up. She did? John said, blinking down at his mother from the top of the stairway. Yes, she did, Mrs. Midas assured him. So you'd better hurry and get yourself washed and brushed. Your party clothes are laid out on your bed. There were games on the Buttercup's lawn while it was still warm enough outside. Later, the party supper, including the birthday cake, was going to be served indoors, and there would be a magician and a short movie. John joined in the blind men's bluff and grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese, and soon he became more cheerful. He even temporarily forgot about chocolate. Now, I don't know about you, but I have no idea what blind man's buff and grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese are. I've never heard of them, but I can infer that maybe there's party games of some sort because he's at a party and he's joining in and they made him more cheerful. So I can infer that there's some sort of party games. Would you agree? Susan looked very pretty. Her yellow curls had been brushed so hard that they looked silkier than ever. She was wearing a blue ribbon the same color as her eyes. Her cheeks were flushed with excitement, a deeper pink than her new party dress. On her feet were dainty little white socks and white shoes with straps that buttoned. Between games, Susan smiled at John and said, I'm glad you came. They seem to be on good terms again. Well, that's good. Then Mr. Buttercup approached, bringing a bucket of water from the garage. He set it down in the middle of the lawn without spilling a single drop. We're going to duck for apples, Susan whispered to John. The boys against the girls. You can be captain of the boys team. The two teams lined up for the race, Susan leading the girls and John the boys. The idea is this, Mr. Buttercup explained. When I say go, not yet, John. Susan and John will run to the bucket. There are 12 apples floating in the bucket and 12 people in the race. Using only their teeth, Susan and John will grab their apples 
and run back to their lines. As soon as they touched the hands of the number two runners in the teams, Dinny and Duncan, Susan and John will go to the end of their lines and Dinny and Duncan will run to the bucket to duck for apples. Do you all understand the way it's going to work? All right, one to get ready, two to get steady, and three to go. What do you think is gonna happen here? I don't even know if I wanna watch. I can't read it. Susan bounded ahead like a jackrabbit and had her face deep in the bucket by the time John reached her side and crouched down for his apple. Did you catch the simile, by the way? Let's read that again. Susan bounded ahead like a jackrabbit. So a jackrabbit is really a fast animal. So the author is comparing the way Susan ran to a jackrabbit so we can really get an image in our head about how fast she's running. He got his eye on a big red one with its stalk jutting up conveniently for him to grab. He lowered his face, opened his mouth, and lunged. Somehow his nose reached the apple before his teeth did and pushed it below the surface of the water. John's mouth followed the apple down. Then a terrible thing happened. The clear water in the bucket turned into dark brown. Sweet, liquid chocolate. Susan and John immediately pulled their heads up, but it was too late. Their faces were drenched with chocolate syrup. Oh, Susan exclaimed, wiping chocolate out of her eyes. Chocolate syrup dripped down all over her delicate pale pink dress. Oh, she moaned. John was in the same state. There was chocolate all over his face. There was chocolate on his white shirt front and on his gray flannel shorts. And there was chocolate in his mouth. Glug, John said. Glug. Susan was too surprised and angry to speak. For the second time that day, she turned her back on John and ran away from him. Mrs. Buttercup offered to clean John up, but he couldn't bear to stay at the party another minute. He started off at once for home. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop today. Um, you know, things aren't going very well for John here at this point. Um, and I'm pretty sure he just wants things back to normal. Um, what I want to leave you with um, as a little activity that you can try at home is I would like you to pretend that when John gets home, he goes into his bedroom and he writes a journal entry, okay? And he's going to write about how he's feeling right now. And what I would really like you to focus on in the journal entry, so I want you to pretend that you are John and you're going to write a journal entry from his point of view. And you're going to write about how you are feeling right now. But what I want you to focus on also is contrasting how you felt in the beginning of the story and how you felt when you first went to that candy store and bought that chocolate and brought it home and put it in your mouth and everything that you tasted started to turn to chocolate. I want you to think about how John felt then in the beginning of the story um, and then how he's feeling at this point in the story. So you're going to pretend that you are him and you're going to write a short narrative, which would be a journal entry um, you know, contrasting basically John's feelings from the beginning up until he's feeling now, okay? And then I will check back in with you next time and we will read two more chapters and we are almost at the end, okay? So I enjoyed hanging out with you again today and I will see you soon. Bye!